Okay. So good morning, everybody. I'm Gene Stanley in Boston, and I appreciate the idea of this uh, uh, meeting where we save a lot of money for travel and a lot of uh, harm to the environment. And I'm going to try in the next few minutes to share with you a, a, a little bit of the things that I and my students have been doing, uh, trying to contribute to the field of economics. So the natural first question you see on the slide, I assume, you'll confirm if that's correct, is the question is, can a physicist contribute to economics? A physicist may be able to contribute to chemistry, in biophysics, but economics. So uh, I, I made a little checklist of what to do. Uh, first, of course, is most important is to get an economics partner, a collaborator, and to respect her or him. And uh, because obviously he or she knows the field. And the second thing, uh, which actually not all economists do, is to collect as much data as you exist. Data exists now, maybe not 30 years ago, but everything exists, everything's written down. In fact, one of the appealing things about this field is that data are already there. You don't have to go out and make experiments. The data are sitting, you have to find where they're sitting, and then you need access to it. But at least the data exists, and people know how to get it. You're, if you're lucky, your economics partner knows how. And then you ask the natural question, what, if anything, are the data telling us? And to find out, we quantify every finding, not to be timid, you have to sometimes aggregate data to smooth out fluctuations, or sometimes the reverse, you want to care about the fluctuations. And then the most challenging thing is to relate the findings. Uh, price is what everyone knows, it's in the newspaper every day, so is the volume. The time between trades is not in the newspaper, but obviously it exists. And volatility, which is like a standard deviation of fluctuations, uh, many findings exist. And uh, just as we would do in, in any field, certainly in critical phenomena, which had witnessed a tremendous growth over several years, is to try to relate the different quantities. And then last but not least, to make a theory. And this is perhaps the most distinguishing feature from how a physicist approaches this field, because in comics, sometimes the theory comes first. And you make the theory, and if it's really beautiful, then you publish it. There's a few famous stories where the theory didn't agree with the facts, but, but uh, the, 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 the person who made the theory said it doesn't really matter, it's such a beautiful theory. That would not happen in physics, but uh, it happens in this field. So I make this dedication to Google and big data and all the other data that are around. The data are there, just what to do with them is the question. Okay. So. Here's my, my title, Quantifying Fluctuations and Time Scales for Milliseconds to Years Using Concepts of Statistical Physics. And uh, more simply, how do we understand this phenomenon of switching without switches? Uh, fluctuations occur, you know, there are big days and bad days and good days and, and not clear what switches. And the, and the radio does speculate is a piece of news but sometimes there's no news, and uh, so it's just not clear. And uh, I emphasize it uh, by collaborators, and not only because they did the work, that's yeah, always been that, but because the ones in green are economists. And I could not do this in a new field without uh, collaborating with someone who really knows the field. And these names in green are people who really know the field. Under that, there's a book that we're not quite finished. It's dated 2020, but it maybe end up being 2021, uh, with uh, two economists in green and uh, a collaborator named Bulderath and Violet. Uh, we call that the rise and fall of the business firm. Okay, so the main point is the next line. We do not understand bubbles. Uh, uh, Isaac Newton, uh, knew this, and he, he uh, is famous for some sentences that uh, that he understand the sun and the moon and the stars, but he cannot understand the bubbles. And, and the story is he apparently lost a lot of money on the South Sea bubble, and uh, he didn't understand it, which of course no one does. 
except you would say in critical phenomena, we don't understand what causes the fluctuations, except that we're near a critical point, and they simply occur. They're given. Okay. So uh, the key uh, thing that physicists may bring to this is the idea that the traders are fixing the price, and that these traders are interdependent on one another. They're coupled. Uh, why is that? Because every trader knows what every other trader is doing, or more precisely knows exactly what's going on, and uh, uh, therefore you have a, 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 a huge network of traders where everyone knows everything, and, uh, and, and uh, the goal is to predict the future back so that you can make money, or at least not lose money. And, uh, uh, if we could predict the future value, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on my, my Caribbean island, swimming in the ocean. But uh, uh, no one can predict the future value. But what one can do is quantify the risk. It's a little like earthquakes and tornadoes and, and heart attacks. We don't know when the next earthquake is, the next tornado, or whether I'm going to have a heart attack tonight or not. But we know the risk, and my doctor will tell me the risk. And uh, a, a geologist can tell you the probability of the earthquake. And the take-home message is very simple. I call it DDD, Data-Driven Discovery. And, uh, and um, that's in contrast to somebody who begins with models. And the second issue is that uh, what data-driven discovery reveals is that finance fluctuations exemplify switching without switches. That means switching occurs all the time and no one's throwing any switch. It just occurs. You might say a little like fluctuations at a critical point. It just occurs. No one's, no one's doing anything. In physics, we learn there's a cause for every effect. If you go near a critical point, all the effects are just happening. You know, <laughs> let's go on. So we start with a concrete example, which is uh, on the y-axis is plotted the average price of 500 big companies called the Standard and Poor Index. It's in the newspaper every day as a function of time in years of a 40-year period. And uh, the, the red curve of the data, and the black curve is a model that is used uh, not only in first year or high school, but it's actually used on trading floors. It's a simple Gaussian. As you see at first glance, it looks pretty real, until you look for some relative, relatively rare events. For example, in 1987, when markets lost 20% of their value. You can see that on the red curve in 1987. It's large scale, so 25% doesn't show that big, but it's a sharp drop. And in contrast, the Gaussian does not have such things, as you know. The probability to have that is 10 to the minus huge number. So the challenge is what to do to understand that. And the Gaussian is what's used. I mean, this is what is used. So obviously, Gaussian is not doing a good job. What was that? <laughs> uh, Okay, so here's a plot on the y-axis, it's called returns. That means if you have a unit of currency, such as a US dollar, and you invest it, what's the return? And uh, this is as a function of time uh, over 12 or 13 years. and. Uh, and the top is a prediction of a simple Gaussian. And uh, it, it, it's not surprising that most of the values are clustered, the first three or four or five standard deviations. And uh, this is a model I emphasize is used on the trading floor with my retirement funds, or retirement funds. The real data are a little more complicated, a lot more complicated. Look at the bottom curve. You see, uh, it's not confined to five standard deviations. In fact, there's some events, such as Black Monday in 1987, where you see the deviation was more than 20 standard deviations. 
And uh, even more recently, in 1997 or so, there's fluctuations. So everyone knows that the returns are not calcium, but uh, and the other thing people know qualitatively is that the large events cluster. For example, if you look at Black Monday, there are many large events uh, just before and just after. And uh, they did like earthquakes. And earthquakes, when there's a big earthquake, there are little earthquakes afterwards, which they call the Omori's Law. And uh, that means after a big shock, there's an aftershock. And, uh, and this is uh, quantified and studied by people. Okay, what do the data tell us? I always believe in asking that question. Start with the data and ask what they're telling us. So uh, here is a, a, a discovery that was made by the two names in the lower left corner, Gopi Krishnan and Plaru, the two brilliant graduate students uh, who did a heroic thing. It may not sound so heroic to physics people, but it was not done before. And they got quite famous by that. They got a database where every stock and every transaction is recorded. They studied a, a thousand stocks. And they had 200,000 data points for each stock. That means they had 200 million data points. They made a simple histogram. Uh, uh, on the x-axis, they had the, the return. And on the y-axis, they had the number of times, that much or more. And of course, that thing decreases. But the remarkable thing, which no one knew, surprisingly, because obviously, you, People in finance know about plots and graphs, and maybe they don't know about power laws, they suddenly heard of them. And uh, look at the data, they're perfectly linear out for standard deviation of roughly 100. And, uh, and the slope of that straight line, of that power law, is uh, almost exactly three. And uh, in, in contrast, uh, uh, well, let's not talk about Matt, but my, my job is not to criticize uh, original people like Matt, but now, if this is a system of interacting subunits, then we think about critical phenomena, Ising models, Heisenberg models, and so forth. And uh, we, uh, 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 we know one of the most striking things, less than a critical phenomenon, is something called universality, a very pretentious word, but it means that the exponents are independent details. And here, the details are the time period studied, the country, volatility, everything else. And uh, here you see uh, on this plot, a log log plot, that the data over several orders of magnitude from roughly trade size of roughly uh, 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 one of the trade size of 10 to the fourth, 10,000. Over that range, the data are uh, approximately linear. Uh, and moreover, the slope of that straight line is the same for different markets. New York, Paris, and London, LSE means London Stock Exchange, is roughly the same. Now, you might think this is well known. My God, everyone should have known this. But the remarkable thing is no one did this. And I, I don't want to tell you why, because it's a long discussion, but, but it's, uh, it's remarkable that no one did this until Gopi Krishnan in Peru, my wonderful students, made this simple plot, and so we all fell off our chairs. Okay, now in, in physics, we look for correlations. Why? And economics would be wonderful. If we do correlations, we can predict the future, and we all be rich. So, what is not correlated much is the returns. That means I invest a dollar now, how much do I have after a certain time interval? And as you see on the left plot, uh, that just falls off exponentially with a time scale of a few minutes. In contrast, what was again not studied to us, was the volatility. What is volatility? The easiest way to say is the absolute value of the returns. So the returns may be huge in one direction and huge in the other direction, so the volatility is big. And you see here over a time scale from roughly one day uh, to almost almost 100 days, so that's one, two, three orders of magnitude, 
the um, I, I didn't say one day. I said uh, one tenth of the day. So it's 2.4 hours. So over three orders of magnitude, the data are approximately linear, and uh, it is very striking. Very striking. Uh, we don't understand this. It's probably one reason economists, if they knew it, they never published it. And uh, sorry for the noise in the background. Uh, fire engines. Uh, Okay. So, even though the returns are not correlated after four minutes on the left plot, the absolute value of the return is correlated over 100 days. So, if, if something's correlated over 100 days, then the returns are not independent one from the other. They're not serially independent. And uh, that's, that's important message. Okay. And I can show you a cartoon, but this cartoon I like. I, I found it when I was flying overseas, and I was bored, and I looked at the Economist, the magazine, and on the cover of this wonderful cartoon, which summarizes a lot what's going on. On the upper left, there's a trader who hears on the telephone from his colleague, I have a stock that will really excel. And the neighbor hears the word really excel, and the next neighbor hears the word excel, and the next one hears, distorts it a little bit to sell. And then that creates a panic, because he says, sell, 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 sell. And, uh, and finally someone says, uh, this is madness, I cannot take it anymore, goodbye, goodbye. And the next one hears the word buy, buy, and then panic again, buy, 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 buy. So, this emphasizes, emphasizes the fact that the traders are interacting one with the other and the subject to external field. Okay, how do I understand this? The obvious thing comes to mind is an icing model. Why? Because an icing model has these two effects. The herd effect, one trader interacts with another, and the news effect, which is what the trader are all subject to the same news. And that makes one think of an icing model, or perhaps something a little more complicated, like an XY model or a Heisenberg model. And the idea of, of, of treating um, uh, the market, uh, uh, this kind of model is not new. Uh, models that have been used are the POTS model, uh, where each unit can be in two different discrete states, or the in-vector model, which actually I proposed when I was a graduate student, where each unit can be in a continuum of states. Okay. okay, here's what everyone wants to know. Is there a model, a law, that can describe these bubbles and crashes? It's very nice to know this. And uh, so to do this, I was very fortunate that a very brilliant a PhD student from Germany, Tobias Price, uh, wanted to come to America for Christmas vacation and wrote me, can I work with you a little bit and I can charge my trip to my, my boss's grant or something like that, I forget the reason. And, uh, and I wasn't too enthusiastic as my wife said, wait a minute, Christmas vacation this year, we were going to do something. And I said, yes, but you know, this is a special opportunity because I knew this person was very good. And he came. And uh, what sealed the deal is he said, I can bring a database which has every transaction of every stock with a certain range. And uh, he did that. And the, the, uh, and the results are shown in the lower left, which is just a plot of the price uh, on different time scales. And the thing I'm trying to emphasize is that there are sort of switching phenomena occur. Market goes, everyone knows it, so for the top curve is the best. Markets are going up, and then suddenly it switches and goes down. It goes up again and switches and goes down. Long time goes down, and switches up and goes down. Everyone knows this, but the exciting thing to someone trained in face positions is you want to know why are these switches? What is, what's causing this? And can we quantify these switches? And therefore, I had something useful to say. 
Okay, so how do we analyze this? And we analyze this in the paper in PNAS with price uh, by by doing what? By isolating these trends. Trend number one, going down, number two, going up, number three, going down again, and so forth. And, um, and you see the price is correlated with the volume, in the bottom plot, the near switching point, there are fluctuations. When the trader always says, let's sell, let's buy, let's buy, let's sell. So the people are trading a lot, but no one knows where the bottom is. If you're going to sell before you hit the bottom, uh, if you want to buy before you hit the bottom, and uh, there's, so there's a lot of speculation when to buy. That's the uncertainty. Why traders have a very rough job because they don't, they don't know what's going to happen. It's just guessing. Okay. So the remarkable thing is, shown here, on the upper left, you see the transaction volume. And um, how are we doing on time? Wonderful. Good. Good enough. Mm -hmm. So on the on the on the, on the uh, left we have the volume of transactions plotted as a function of the distance in time from the switch point. And as you see, there's a sharp peak. In fact, it looks like the Greek letter lambda. It makes one think of the critical points. The lambda transition in helium is that's why that looks like a lambda. And uh, and on the right, we have the time between trades. So obviously there's a huge volume, there must be less time between trades. So this is now this is nothing actually new. But what is new is the bottom plot. The bottom plot is nothing more than a large large plot of the top plots. So on the left you see the volume on large scale as a function of the distance from the switch point. And you see the, uh, the, on, the on the right you have uh, the, the time between trades as a function of the of, of the uh, epsilon, the distance. And the, the remarkable thing is, there's a power law. There's a power law. I mean, this is some. This is not. Why it's so remarkable? Because this is made by humans. This is not some phenomenon in liquid helium. And this is controlled by the laws of nature. This is controlled by humans on the trading floor who have no idea what the future is, but they're gambling on the future. And, uh, and, and uh, the fact that these results are set by simple laws is very exciting. In fact, the paper we wrote with Price and led to a lot of publicity. It was written up in Physics World uh, and so forth and so on. This is reminiscent of Critical phenomena. And this is a very famous plot for liquid helium by Buckingham, Fairbank, and Keller, which shows the specific heat on the y axis as a function of the distance and temperature in the lambda transition. And the left panel is in degrees, the middle panel is in milli degrees, and the right panel is in micro degrees. And as you see, they all look the same because it's the same function. The same thing we have in, 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 uh, in finance, which is remarkable because they emphasize helium is controlled by God, so to speak. That's a natural substance. But trading is controlled by traders who have free will and certainly are not trying to mimic helium. No one says, hey, it does not look like helium. Change your decision. Of course not. So this is very remarkable, really remarkable. You don't fully understand this. So maybe some of you in the audience want to talk about this. And my email is my initials, three letters, A G S at B U, two letters, B like Boston, U like University, dot E D U. A G S at B U dot E D U. If anyone wants to discuss this and collaborate, I'd be very delighted. Okay. So the main point is that the behavior is like critical phenomena. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the question is why? Why should independent free will traders uh, 
and behave anything at all like giving it, which uh, did not have free will. So we speculated about this a lot. In fact, it was the speculations were written up in the physics world, and not clear, not clear, this is only speculation. But roughly, the traders have a kind of network. They all watch the identical screen. If I look at a trader in, in Singapore, a trader in New York, they're watching exactly the same screen. So when something happens, a trader worries to miss the switch. The market's about to go down. The trader better find out to get to unload some things. Or vice versa, if it's about to go up, the trader should buy. The only problem is we don't know when it's going to go up or go down. But it does behave like a power law. For example, the bottom uh, left plot is the volume of trades. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, has a sharp lambda like shape. Uh, and, and the right panel is the time between trades, which has also a sharp dip. And these dips and these peaks can be fit, roughly, of course, it's not like critical phenomena, but it can be fit by power laws. Let's see how that goes. The, this is a plot on the y-axis of the time between trades, the so-called intertrade waiting time. And on the x-axis is uh, this distance from the switching point, we call epsilon. There are two categories here below, epsilon less than one, the red circles, and when you're above, epsilon greater than one, the blue triangles. And uh, you see that the data, and the striking thing, is that the data are linear were roughly two orders of magnitude. Okay, but it couldn't be better. And then also wrapping up, thank you for telling me. Uh, and this is the main striking thing that from the, I call it from the very small to the very large. The same law is describing what's going on over nine orders of magnitude from the scale of, of uh, uh, 10 milliseconds up to 100 days. That's nine orders of magnitude. You can see it's multiplied out of the bottom. And the, the graphs look similar. You don't you know, have to look what's plotted exactly, but the graphs look very similar. Okay. And now the last point is a little more sophisticated. Many of you know the name Eugene Wigner. Many of you know that he did many things, and one of them was random matrix theory. And uh, the, um, so if we apply this random matrix theory to the data, you see that uh, the data fit the random matrix theory very well, except for some deviations. Uh, there are 20 or so eigenvalues that do not conform to that. And the interesting thing is that each of those eigenvalues corresponds to an eigenvector, and each eigenvector is a set of firms that are doing something similar, with some reason to be strongly correlated. And here's the plot that shows that. These are all the deviating ones, and you see one firm's dealing with transportation, and it's with paper, and so forth and so forth. Well, that's about it. And thank you. Came right on time, didn't I? <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Professor Stanley.